Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to Talk Now Radio, listener-supported radio, where no topic is taboo. And as usual, we are brought to you by Revolution Radio, listener-supported radio, where information never sleeps. I want to remind everybody that both the shows are listener-supported, so any uh, donations, clicking on any ads on the web pages or anything like that, helps to keep us on the servers and keep us from uh, being censored by people who don't want to hear certain things that we might have to say. Also, I would like to take a moment out real quick before I start the show to thank everybody who has uh, supported me during this last month I was in the hospital. Uh, I think it really counted for a whole lot, and it really done me a lot of good, so I want to appreciate you folks for that. So, John, are you with us today? Yes, I am. Just double-checking. I know I had you on the line a minute ago. I just wanted to make sure Skype didn't drop you. (laughs) Well, they haven't cut me off yet. So, um, I was going to talk today about your book. A Government of Wolves. Uh, now, I haven't had a chance to read it yet. I did read the description of it, and, uh, you know, it kind of got my interest because we were talking earlier before the show started about some of the corruption that's going on in that. But why don't you give us a little better idea about the book, uh, you know, what we can expect to find in it, and maybe what got you interested in writing it? Well, I'm a president of the Rutherford Institute. We're a civil liberties group. We handle cases all across the country. In fact, we have a big case we just entered today in Amarillo, Texas, which we may want to talk about, but we get involved in a lot of cases around the country. Uh, over the last, and I've been, I've been a civil liberties lawyer for about 40 years. Over the last, I'd say, 15, 20 years, I've seen a, a, a rapid increase in uh, SWAT team raids, people getting, innocent people getting shot on the streets. Um, what, we, what we saw just uh, recently with uh, the guy in New York, Eric Goner, getting choked to death. Uh, more of that's happening across the country. In fact, the case we have in Amarillo, Texas is very similar to the Eric Garner case, except it's an eighth grader this time. But uh, I've seen uh, so much violence, uh, people getting shot in their homes. I go through all this in my book, A Government of Wolves. The subtitle is The Emerging American Police State. So I go through all this and detail what I see is happening. The National Security Agency, uh, uh, I've worked with uh, NSA agents. Uh, everything you do now, your bank records, your text messages, your phone calls, uh, what, you, what, you, what you do on Facebook is all downloaded by the government now. You all, have, everybody has a file. Every everybody out here listening to this program, if you do anything electronically, like you have a file. So that alarmed me. Uh, there's a great quote by Edward R. Murrow, a great CBS commentator. He said, "A nation of sheep begets a government of wolves." And I, I thought, what kind of government prowls around doing these kind of things? Eighty thousand SWAT team raids. Eighty percent of those are for just mere warrant service, where a police used. To, Police officer used to show up at your door and knock on the door and hand you a warrant. Now they're going through doors at 3 a.m. in the morning. Kids are getting killed. People should go to our website at Rutherford.org. <clears throat> I just wrote a column yesterday on all the kids are being killed in SWAT team raids. Seven-year-old kids getting shot. Right? Police say by mistake, but nevertheless, they're dead. So I'm seeing all these things happening, um, the tanks on the streets, Stuff that the founding fathers, by the way, warned against. They said, don't ever allow this. Don't ever allow a standing army. You'll regret it. Well, that's where we're at today. So <clears throat> our government is not very, very friendly if you disagree. Let's put it that way, because I handle the cases, I know. Yeah, I noticed I uh, signed up for your newsletter, and I've been getting some of the uh, you know, feeds from that in my email. And it sounds like you guys got a whole lot going on down there. So, you know, do... Uh, You've got an active, ongoing battle for everybody's civil rights, but you're handling it on a uh, case-to-case basis then? Yeah, across the country. We have uh, any one time 100 cases we may be involved in, some before the Supreme Court. We work with other groups. Uh, The lawyers in Texas work with us. They work pro bono. They donate their time. We raise money to get people in the courtroom so they can get a lawyer because it's people out there that get lawyers. No, they're expensive. (laughs) Usually they want a 5000 retainer fee, and uh, the kind of people we defend can't afford that. So we make sure they get their day in court. Uh, and maybe if you want to talk about this case in Amarillo, it gives a good example. It's uh, an eighth grader whose brother had died, and he wanted to wear his brother's rosary beads. <clears throat> it was prohibited at school. He was told he couldn't wear rosary beads at school because it's a gang symbol, so he put it inside his shirt. Then he asked the principal, he said, I'm going to the football game Friday night. This is back in October. Can I wear my rosary? The president said, sure. Yeah, a football game, you know, it's not doing school hours. 
So the police walked up to him and saw the rosary beads and told him to take them off. And he said, but the principal said I could wear them. And he started arguing with the police. Well, they slammed him face down. He couldn't breathe. He was taken to a de- detention center and he had to go to the hospital. This is an eighth grader. And all based on the fact that they shouldn't have done it in the first place. So that's a case we're entering today. But we're seeing those kind of cases on a routine basis uh, happening across the country. It's not just isolated, a few isolated incidences. So uh, we moved into a new territory in this country, and I'm telling people, you better wake up. You better start getting involved in your government uh, and um, take this thing back. Because, uh, I mean, I talk with NSA agents, people out of Washington, D.C., that tell me we only have a few years left before the country can lock down. And most people don't realize in January, drones start flying over the country. They'll have scanning devices, weapons on them, uh, they'll be, and the police will have those as well. Uh, and they've been authorized. They've been authorized. President Obama signed a, signed a, in, a law allowing them to fly over America without any civil liberties protections. I've lobbied Congress to give us some protections against them. But can you imagine they can go fly over your home and scan your home and see what you're doing inside and fly off, record it? And uh, people are getting these weird uh, SWAT team raids. When uh, we had, we had another case in Texas where a fellow uh, they were going to do a routine knock on the door. Uh, warrant service, they found out he had a legally owned shotgun. They did a SWAT team raid through the middle of the night. They sh- his door was locked, so they shot him through the door of his own home. So we're seeing more of that. Well, so what I'm saying is if, a, if you're cleaning your uh, BB gun or something and a drone can't tell the difference between a BB gun and a whatever kind of rifle that may be dangerous. You could get shot just for cleaning your BB gun. Well, you could get a SWAT gun. team raid, yeah. And so... But, you know, and again, I work with a lot of veterans. Cases I have with veterans today are really egregious. We might want to talk about some of those. Yeah, but in the fact that I am a veteran, maybe I need to hear this. Well, I'm a veteran, too. I'm an infantry veteran, an officer. Um, probably the most notable case I detail in my book, of Government of Walls, is uh, a decorated, beneath, um, decorated Marine named Brandon Robb. Uh, about a year and a half ago, he was at home typing. He has a home business. He had just got through jogging. He had no shirt on he hears a loud noise outside. Cars pulling up on his driveway, about eight vans, and he sees these guys running toward his home. They're some, some were in uh, plain clothes, but the, most of them were in black outfits, SWAT team kind of gear. He goes to the window. He's, a, again, a decorated Marine, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. He looks out, and he, go, he sees these guys running. He opens the door and says, what's up, guys? And they say, uh, we, we want to talk to you. We're concerned about some things you're doing. Well, what he had done is he had... Uh, got on Facebook and did some anti-Obama Facebook posts and cited some rap lyrics. So he stepped out, and they said, we're concerned about your Facebook posts. They grabbed him really quick, handcuffed him behind his back. He asked for his shirt, and they said no. They led him to the car. He said he started saying, hey, I don't want to do this. They slammed him against the fence, lacerated his back. When he got into the police station, this is near Richmond, Virginia, when they got into the police station, he asked for bandages. Instead of the bandages, they slapped the prison shirt he's on him, which he said sunk him through the cuts on his back and hurt so bad. I called the police chief and asked what he was charged with. The police chief said, uh, uh, he was kind of stumbling, so we haven't charged him with anything. We're, we're just concerned about his Facebook post. He was given a five-minute examination by a psychiatrist in a jail cell. The psychiatrist said he thought he was mentally disturbed because he had long pauses between, sometimes between answering a question. Well, Brandon's wise. You don't... You don't tell state officials anything if you don't have your lawyer present. You're being charged with something. He was put in a hospital. We filed a lawsuit, a mental hospital. We filed a lawsuit and got him out. Now he sued the federal government. But veterans across the country are getting those same kind of visits. There's a program called Operation Vigilant Eagle out of the Department of Homeland Security where veterans are watched continually on Facebook. Uh, we've had vet- I've had wet veterans in my office weeping. They've had uh, visits from the NSA saying if they did any more Facebook posts or text messages that were anti-government, they were going to take them outside the country. And this is happening uh, in America. It doesn't matter. I, I, I see it on a daily basis because this is my the work I do. But uh, it's frightening is the word. So it doesn't That's why matter I call my book if, they, uh, rules. if they're anti-republic or anti-democrat or one, one party or another, it's just anti-government, period. Anti-government. What Brandon Robb didn't like the Marine was uh, Obama's executive orders, where Obama just proclaims what he wants to proclaim, whether it's immigration or down the line. So he acts like a dictator, essentially, according to Brandon Robb. He didn't like it. Uh, 
but uh, that's not he's not the only one. I mean, there are, there are, those cases are happening across the country. There are, again, there's a program called Operation Vigilant Eagle where the Department of Homeland Security watches returning vets. I work with returning vets, and they're watched as if they were criminals. They go over and serve the country, but they come back here and they watch them like the criminals. Yeah, this is all happening bad. under the Obama administration. I'm not sure what – it didn't really arise until Obama came into office. So. I thought it was really starting to rise to Bush right after 911. Well, Bush institutes the programs, but Operation Vigilant Eagle, Eagle actually started under Janet Napolitano, who was the head of the Department of Homeland Security at the time. Yeah, yeah it was so. kind of like an add-on to what Bush was doing. Basically so. It just moved forward. Yeah, Bush started the train rolling. Obama has taken over as the chief engineer and is moving the train very quickly. So much so that people I work with on the right and the left politically are all saying, if something doesn't slow down, what's happening in the government? Uh, like I said, uh, freedom as we know it is going to be lost. Well, you think a lot of the stuff the government's doing is because they themselves are spooked after terrorist attacks and some of the things that, uh, like police used to get shot all the time uh, when pulling people over, and maybe the government's starting to get spooked? Well, that's not what we're seeing. No, I don't think that the, the government's not spooked about terrorists because they're – there are no terrorist attacks virtually at all. Uh, what we're seeing, and again, I'm, I work with people in and out of government who tell me these things, uh, you, you're just seeing a government that's pr it's protecting itself. It's very, very much in control, and it's moving us in a direction. I mean, when let's go back 20 years ago. You didn't see police in camouflage outfits riding tanks down the street. Very true. Changed. So there's been a direct move. The Department of Homeland Security hands out most of this equipment free to them. So it's basically your police departments are being run out of the Department of Homeland Security now. You don't have local police anymore, in the true sense of the word. Most of the time, you don't. Or at least in most of the places. Most of the places, uh, they're getting their equipment, their money. Uh, SWAT, you wonder what people say, why are so, why all these SWAT team raids? On, where kids are getting shot, they always shoot the dogs, they're shooting people through doors. Well, they actually get federal grants for doing raids on marijuana. So if you have an ounce of marijuana, you could get killed. Now, they go back. When I was a young man, if you had a, something the police thought was illegal, they knocked on your door and handed you a, a warrant. Make sure it was the right place. What happens is they're, they're entering the wrong places now. A good case in Arizona was a case, another case I detailed in my book, Young on the Wall, was Jose Guerrero, a other decorated Marine. The police uh, were doing a sweep of his neighborhood trying to find marijuana. 3 a.m. in the morning. They always come through a, a, in the morning when you're asleep. Came through his door, a big SWAT team, all in their military gear and their masks and their guns. Jose Garana being alert, since he was a Marine, he put his uh, wife and kids in the closet, stood at the end of his hallway with his rifle. The only rifle he has is a hunting gun. Police, the SWAT team sees him, they fire off 70 times at him. Uh, Mind you, he's just holding the rifle. They hit him 50 times. He bleeds to death on his own floor while his wife is screaming, watching him die. Police claim that they, he shot at them. A report showed he never got, took the safety off his weapon. They found no marijuana in his home. They were in the wrong home. They were in the wrong that, home. That's and they, why you they, they didn't have to pay a price for what they did. No, they didn't. The Fourth Amendment, no, no, they have qualified immunity. They're, they're not held liable. Um under the Fourth Amendment, again, I tell people, read your Constitution. That's what our founders gave us a great piece of work here. It says, before the police can do surveillance on you, touch you, seize you, enter your home, they have to have probable cause. That means evidence that you're doing something illegal, not a generalized suspicion. And if it's not uh, an emergency, which possession of marijuana or something like that wouldn't be, um, they need to go forward judging you a warrant and then knock on your door to make sure they're at the right place. But, so these but, are the cases we're seeing across the country. Yeah, and I know it's happening in, you know, almost every state around the world, if not every state in America. I can't speak for anything in other countries, but I know what I see, uh, you know, posted all over Facebook and, you know, about all these people getting shot for a little bit of nothing. I mean, uh, I think one guy, they shot because he had a cell phone and thought he was going for a gun. Yeah, Um uh, there was a fellow, too, that uh, got out of his car, and the police drove up. They didn't know. They just were doing a drive-by. They pulled up. He turned with the keys in his hand. They thought it was a gun. They shot him. There was the old man walking down the driveway with his cane. It was twilight. Police drove by. They thought he had a rifle. When they drove by, he picked his cane up like anybody would, trying to find his way, 
they shot him on the driveway. Well, let me ask you this. You see these people uh, posting YouTube videos and uh, putting them on Facebook as well, where they're in these here lineups where the police got everybody stopped and they're checking them out and they're asked to pull over and they're like, are you detaining me? And they give these cops a really hard time about the technicalities of the law. When these people do this, are they placing themselves in any kind of danger? Uh, yeah, you are. I, I, you have to be careful how you address people today. Talking back, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I address police the few times I've been pulled over about what they're doing. Uh, you can do that, but I'd be sure it's not in the middle of the night where you're by yourself. Uh, I'd have your wife or whoever's in the car recording the conversation on your cell phone. That may get you in trouble as well because the police do not like to be filmed. They're ending people's private. We have a case in uh, Oregon where they were doing a SWAT team raid. A fellow came out. This is one of our cases. He had his laptop. He tried to film it with his laptop. He was standing on his own front yard. The police said, turn it off. He said, sir, I'm on my private property. They rushed him, smashed him down, all face down on the ground, and, and worked him over. So that's the case we have. They don't like being filmed. This is America, or is it America? This is not the America I grew up in, now. But the one I grew up in, I mean, when I grew up back in the 50s and 70s area, uh, there wasn't no SWAT teams nowhere. Yeah. Uh, you it know, all came out of... Uh, top and then they would be nice to you and talk to you. Yeah, what they're getting is certain, you know, they're getting new equipment. About 40% of the equipment police get, but people uh, argue, well, they're just getting old equipment from Afghanistan. Well, that's not true. About 40 to 45% of it's new equipment. So large corporations are making a lot of money off of it. Obama, people like that. Uh, what I find most of the time, and I do when we take these cases on, when we, we uh, are finding a law, we trace to back to find out how what some of these crazy laws get passed. It's usually some large corporation that has lobbied it and has some politicians in their hip pocket. We have uh, we, we enter all these we have cases across the country where people want a single chicken in their backyard for eggs. It's illegal now. When now that you're talking about big corporations spending a lot of this, I don't know if you feel comfortable answering this and since it's gonna name names, but out of at least your corporations, is a lot of the times it maybe the Koch brothers yeah, I don't know about the Coke brothers. I hear about the Coke brothers all the time. I just know that uh, the corporations, are, like for drones, for example, dr there's a reason drones are going to start flying over America. I mean, I I've talked to other countries. They're freaked out about it. I mean, I wrote the first, by the way. You can go on our website. I wrote the first anti-drone law. It was passed in my little town here in Charlottesville, Virginia. It caused international sensation. I had people from Germany, Sweden in my office interviewing me, journalists. And they kept saying, why do Americans want drones flying, armed drones that could sweep over them and shoot them and stop protests and stuff? I said, I'm not sure Americans want it, but I looked it up. It's a $30 billion a year industry starting in January this year. Yeah, that and definitely there's, has there's, to be from there's somebody 10, else. There's 10 large corporations that are making, about 10 are making most of the money. Only people so, can afford it. Uh, just so you know, Princeton just did a study. Princeton University with some other universities, they, they, decided, they wanted to look at how America really operates. They came to a clue, conclusion, and they said it. America is an oligarchy. It's run by uh, a corporate elite, and your votes are being virtually nothing. They decide everything. So, and if you disagree out there on the street, you better be careful. So you make yourself a target. Up. You better be careful, yes. Okay. I mean, there are ways. In my book, A Government of Wolves, I have a whole section on what I think we can do, how we can take this thing back. But it takes thinking it through, being careful, uh, being very public about it. I personally think before we can take anything back, you're going to have to get more of the average uh, civilian on board on the same page. I agree, and that's what I'm trying to do. That's why I uh, do radio shows like this. That's why I write my books. That's why we take on the cases we're doing. We're trying to get, trying to show people that something has changed, and radically so. I mean, you may not agree with uh, what happened in Ferguson, Missouri, and I don't either. But the issue there was, and I told policemen this, and I work with a lot of good cops, by the way, who don't like this. When you show up in a tank and fatigue and point guns at people, you're going to get a reaction. Uh, I've worked with good cops who don't do that. They go up and shake hands with the protesters, talk to them, the protesters walk off, and it's over. There's a way to handle these things. 
Uh, again, I consult with some cops on this stuff, but uh, you know, if you if you if you want to act like the military, people are going to start responding in a different way. They're going to resist because we're we're taught in school that we do have some right, and in, in some schools, by the way, <laughs> not a lot. Because I'm finding that uh, education about the Bill of Rights has gone out of schools. Most kids, I I have an intern program. I've had it for almost 30 years. For students come in and study, study with me in the summer, I've yet to find one student who can give me the freedoms of the First Amendment. These are law students. Well, have you heard about Obama? According to my son, John, he told me this morning that Obama's trying to pass laws to make these policemen have to wear these cameras to film everything they do. You heard anything about that? Yeah, it's a $263 million project funded by Taser International, a large corporation. Uh, so there's conflicting evidence on these cameras. Some people say they work, uh, others say they don't. In Los Angeles, the cops were wearing them, and for some reason, mysteriously, occasionally, they would be turned off in certain situations. <laughs> That's what I said to John earlier this morning. <laughs> Plus, there are surveillance cameras, by the way. If you see it, and, and you're going to see more and more of them because there's a lot of money to make. $263 million, Taser International, who does the Taser, is going to make a lot of money off of this. And they're going to continue to make money off of this, pushed by the government. Uh, there are surveillance cameras, so when a policeman walks up to you, you better know your Fifth Amendment. You have a right not to incriminate yourself. The right so to remain silent. What I'm t- telling the before you put these cameras on policemen, the policemen should, when they walk up and start questioning you, they should give you your rights. Because at that point, if you did anything, you're in trouble. Or even if you didn't, if you can make it look like you did. <laughs> As a surveillance camera, they're going to be able to walk and pan and see all kinds of activity. Now, what did I just say about the Fourth Amendment a few minutes ago? The Fourth Amendment says before you do surveillance on anybody, you have to have probable cause. We're bypassing all that. We don't teach our students that. People don't know it. We're, uh, and the reason we have the Fourth Amendment in the Constitution, uh, when the, some of the framers saw the Constitution and didn't like it, they said we need a specific bill of rights and you need to protect it. So they wanted the Fourth Amendment, which is an anti-police state provision, you can't crash through people's doors. You can't do surveillance. You can't run up and grab them and slam them down, again, unless you have evidence of criminality. And criminality is not talking back to a cop. Remember about the First Amendment, what does it say? You have a right to free speech. It also has a, you have a right to petition your government for a redress of grievances. But uh, many instances today, policemen are telling people, you can't even say, uh, I disagree to a cop. You go face down. And sometimes your dog gets broken. We have those cases as well. Well, aside from the case-to-case, uh, you know, in-court uh, defenses that you're doing on this here, you got any projects going on that's, uh, I guess you could say, a broader spectrum, like uh, a grassroots uh, movement to make actual changes within the government itself? Well, we're trying to do that. I mean, again, like I say in my book, my book is sold well. It's won two major awards. It's actually gotten out there, or Government of Wolves. Um, I'm telling people to get organized in your communities, but the one problem we have is uh, the average American watches 150 hours of television a month, and that's increasing. Uh, Americans sit and watch a lot. Uh, what I'm telling Americans is take one-third of those hours and get involved in your local communities. Uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, they basically stormed their city meeting there. They all got together in a group and went down and... Uh, objecting to the way the police uh, were acting, also all this military equipment, and demanding that people send it back. In some county, uh, in California, they did the same thing. Um, America was founded on the basis of local government. It works, but you're going to have to get involved. You're going to get uh, what I call civil liberties oversight committees, where people, just average Americans get together when they see a SWAT team raid and someone gets shot, an innocent person. They go down to city council and they object. They hold their politicians accountable. So that's the only way you can change things in this country. The people in Washington, D.C. don't listen very well. Not to the average citizen, anyway. Yeah, I can see that. And that's why I was saying earlier about getting large groups of people, getting the citizens. I mean, it, it seems like right now, the government and the church together have gotten everybody so divided that we're so busy feuding amongst ourselves, we can't bend into a single movement to get anything accomplished. That's true. Uh, again, when I, again, I've been doing this for 40 years. I've, seen, I've, been, I've sued politicians. I've sued the President of the United States. I've won cases on these issues. The government likes to see us screaming and yelling at one another. What's the old phrase, divide and conquer? Uh-huh. 
Yeah, but I saw people on the right and on the left yelling at one another from Ferguson. I went, well, that's not going to do us any good. No. What's the solution in Ferguson? Uh, why were people objecting? Well, obviously, as we see with the Eric Garner case, the guy they choked to death in New York, the case we have in Amarillo where they choked this kid and had to put him in a hospital in eighth grader. There needs to be some oversight now. The, your local city councils are not doing it. So citizens are going to have to provide oversight. They're going to have to get involved. They're going to have to protest. I mean, people forget, what, 1776, what did they do? They were revolutionists. Today they'd be called terrorists. Yeah, they probably would. Yeah, the NSA would have a lot of records on them today, yes. And they'd be watching them. I mean, we we have these cases where people want to do a simple free speech protest against something in town. They do text messages. The FBI downloads those, reads them, and then they go in and actually meet with the people before the protest and try to discourage it. And they do many times. They basically threaten them. Now, hmm. is this what America, how America should operate? Uh, no, it really no. shouldn't. But it does, unfortunately. Yeah, we're, we're uh, headed in a very bad direction. Let's put it that way. I haven't given up yet. I have friends who have actually given up. They've left the country. Well, I know in a lot of these cases, the evidence for the actual thing that goes down is very clouded. Look at the Ferguson case. They had a video up that you, everybody could watch where the Michael Brown had supposedly robbed that store before running into Wilson. The problem with the video was it wasn't clear enough to tell for sure if he actually was robbing the place or if he had actually paid for his stuff and left like he was supposed to. And then you got one side hollering one thing, one side hollering another, and then I began to wonder, was it planned to be that way in the first place? Well, that's another thing. You're, you're raising a good issue, maybe not directly, but I'll point. They, here, the government admits this. They use what they call urban crisis actors. They're trained uh, agents. The FBI has 15,000 paid informants, they admit it, who infiltrate groups, who infiltrate protests. In fact, it was recently, I forget what city, an FBI agent pulled a gun on a protester. The protester responded, hey, I'm an FBI agent. (laughs) It's true. That was a story I read. Uh, It it, it kind of freaked people out. But the FBI, by the way, has been doing that since the 1950s. They infiltrate any kind of what they consider to be a a resistance group. That way they can divide and conquer before it gets out of hand. And the uh, urban crisis actors, I mean, go to our website. I've written about this. They they do... uh, a couple of years ago in San Diego, they did a they created a zombie town, and zombies were average Americans, gun owners basically. And the crisis actors went in; they they played like they were zombies or people armed with guns. And the the other actors, these are all FBI agents, Department of Homeland Security people. So sometimes when you see things happening in cities, you maybe not be dealing with an actual protester. I'm just saying maybe things are not always as they appear to be. Not in the government we have. No, we live in a secret. It's a, it's a secret government. I mean, before Edward Snowden, how many people realize that everything you do on Facebook, Twitter, your text messages, your bank accounts are all downloaded and watched by the government? With this incident with Edward Snowden, to your knowledge, has it caused the uh, government and the people that were doing all this here stuff to uh, curb their activity since there was too much uh, of a spotlight on them? No, not a thing. Continually unabated. Uh, I talked to former NSA agents who tell me it's actually gotten worse. Uh, they're downloading, and again, this, this, they actually admit some things. They admit to downloading the NSA 225 million text messages a day of American citizens. That's more than they have time to read. Well, they have the computer system. The computer system they have in Utah, their Utah facility, actually parses the information, reads it, hands it to the agent. For example, if I'm on this show or and we're talking. They think we're radicals. We're watched. And you are watched. The FBI admits that they can turn your laptop on from a distance. It becomes a camera. They can turn your cell cell phone on. Even when you've turned it off, it becomes a microphone. So I'm telling people, even in your own home now, if you're talking about something you shouldn't be talking about, don't. So sometimes it's not even safe to talk about things with your family at the dining room table. No, not the cell phone around. Now, and the new smart TVs, by the way, they're coming out with those soon. They have facial recognition software, voice recognition software. Well, aren't these violations of our rights? I think they are, yeah. Sure they are. We know that, but the government doesn't get give a poop about the uh, 
Fourth Amendment. And the only way to put a change to it is to have enough people stand up and protest. You need a mass, like, what I call mass uprising. Yeah, we need that. I, I'm hoping that the things we're seeing now that will get people, it needs to be nonviolent. Violence will not work. What I warn people of this, and I know this, your average small town has enough firepower now and assault vehicles. They'll soon have drones to put down any kind of uprising. Nonviolence drives them crazy. That's why they. That's why they're going to have drones watching it. That's why they have FBI agents reading your text messages and watching you. It's why the NSA now is watching kids. By the way, this is another interesting facet of what we're seeing. Uh, they're contacting high schools now and, and, and middle schools so that when kids do Facebook posts, they, they, they don't like the NSA. Kids are called in. They're reporting to the schools. So they're watching everything you're doing. Well, now, I read online that Facebook and Yahoo had uh, agreed to stop uh, sending the information into the NSA. Are you telling me that that was just a front, that they're still uh, the Facebook and Yahoo are still uh, delivering the information? I don't. I wouldn't trust what they say, no. Uh, Amazon admits they work with the CIA. In fact, they just, Amazon just built the, a $20 million intelligence cloud where all the agencies can share in all the information, all 17 intelligence agencies. Google works with the NSA. They admit it openly. And yet nobody stands up and says a word other than to argue. Well, I'm saying a word. There are good <laughs> people out there saying a word, and they're, they're, they're saying they don't like this. Um, the question is, how do you get the average American up off their butts and engaged in this before it's too late? Uh, if you have, I, I tell people this, you have children or grandchildren, be concerned. Because their future is going to look different than your future. Yeah, their future could time. cascade right around them. And if you don't alert them, you don't make them aware, um, they're, they're probably not going to know what's happened. Yeah, that's why I, mean, I, I have a granddaughter. She's seven years old. She's only seven years old. I talked to her about this thing, these things. I talked to my kids about it, too. I think they need to know. In fact, my kids have taken an active interest, especially my uh, youngest one, in politics. So yeah. that, that, did, that did my heart good to see that. <laughs> get, yeah, get involved. Um, the thing that we have to understand is, I'll go back and say it again, is you're dealing with a government that is a secret government. It's... Uh, and it's expanding all over the world, by the way. I mean, most people don't know that the uh, NSA has a program called Echelon and Five Eyes, where they have bases all over the world. I know they got that Echelon computer. Well, the Five Eyes program, they have bases in Australia, New Zealand, Great Britain, different countries around the world. So they basically elected, uh, I call it in the book, my book, A Government of Wolves, uh, an electronic concentration camp. Yeah, pretty much from what I'm seeing, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, the way the system's pretty much working is you got a front government like your president, uh, Senate, Congress, the House, whatever, that everybody's elected in. But in all actuality, they, they're not the ones that's making all the big decisions. It's the uh, people with all the money who's uh, guiding what decisions are actually being made, and that would be your secret government. It's the secret government. In fact, I'm telling people there are a couple movies you should watch if you haven't seen them. Watch Minority Report. That's a Steven Spielberg film, Tom Cruise. The movie set in 2054 with all this awesome technology, that technology the government always already has, so they're 40 years ahead of the curve. Also, The Matrix, where you're not sure what you're dealing with sometimes, who you're talking to. Again, let me go back and say this. If the FBI admits they have 15,000 paid informants that infiltrate organizations, groups, and companies, you don't know who you're talking to sometimes. They admit they, they do that, and they admit they specifically infiltrate nonprofit groups. So basically, that. I'm pretty sure it's not just nonprofit groups. There's probably uh, town meetings, church oh, yeah. meetings, uh, Sunday school meetings, anywhere that any of this could be discussed. They probably got at least one or two people with ears on that nobody even knows they got that side to them. And if you're organizing a civil liberties group in your community, uh, you have to be cognizant of the fact that one of the people in your group may not be who they seem. But let me go back. This is not conspiracy theory. This is all footnoted. I, in fact, uh, one uh, radio talk show host says, I want to call you a conspiracy theorist, but you have 30 pages of footnotes in your book. So I footnote everything. The government admits these things. They're, they're in your face about it. But the, you know, they, the, what they think what they, and they believe is the average American will blow it off. They won't care. 
I mean, where's the massive right. uprising about the NSA when we find out about them snooping and downloading and using it against us, or dragging a Marine out of his home because he does anti-government Facebook posts and putting him in a mental hospital? I go back and ask the question, is this America? This Is, is, this, is this what we really want? So it's, uh, it's like waking up after a 10-day drunk. And someone threw water in your face and saying, "Get up and get out of bed, and let's see, let's try to change this thing." And then you find out that nobody has ears to hear. That's, fine. That's basically true most of the time. Yeah, I, I talked to a lot of discouraged people who basically said, "It's over. I'm giving up." And I yeah, tell them, I hear that an awful lot. Of people will tell me, "What's the use in fighting it? It's not going to work. You can't get enough people, you know, rallied on any one particular side." Why even bother? And a lot of people just roll over and play dead because they can't get anybody else involved. Well, I can say I have a granddaughter. I have children. Uh, I want to see them live in a free country. And I want to see my fellow Americans, the kids growing up in school now. I don't want to see them led off in the wrong direction. And um, I've studied Nazi Germany and the old Soviet Union. It's almost like we've taken the Nazi Germany handbook and playing it out. Perfect. In fact... I worked with uh, college students. I had a group of college students. I wanted to know where the black kind of slot team gear came from that we used to see more of. Now they've come to the camouflage. They went off in the, about two months. They did a series of uh, studies, and they came back, and they put a paper down in front of me, well-detailed, footnoted, and I looked at it, and they said, you're probably going to be surprised, but maybe not. They showed me pictures of Nazi guys standing with ball hats on and gear, and it was so similar to the Nazis. <laughs> what the American cops were wearing, it blew my mind. <laughs> well, I was also going to ask you, do you think... And black, they... you know, is, black is the color of authority. It's a non-color. It's what all authoritarian regimes put on their their government agents and police. You mean like, be the, like uh, men uh, in black? black? Men in black. Black is the color of authority. Blue is the color of trust. And brown is the color of trust. Yeah, I couldn't help but think about the black Pope. He dresses in all black. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know about that one. <laughs> well, every picture I've seen of them on online was. But, yeah, um, do you think the day's going to come when guns will be outlawed in America and confiscated? They would very much like to outlaw guns, yes. Um, and I hear a lot of groups saying guns, we need to outlaw guns and all that. Well, if we're going to outlaw guns, it's taken away from the government, and you might have me in your back seat saying this might be a good idea. But if you're just going to take it away from the average American, the balance goes away. So, and you're going to be facing some of the most terroristic-looking government agents you've ever seen in your life. Well, and, what and, I'm and asking... I, I would say that gun ownership in some areas is probably one of the few things that's keeping the country free. I was going to say, I'm kind of thinking what's really going to happen, though, is if they ever do try to clamp down on the gun laws, they're going to probably have a big revolution on their hands. Yeah, but see, yeah, they're gearing up for that. You asked me about earlier, what are they gearing up? They're gearing up for that. They're really nervous about veterans because veterans have been gone over and trained. A lot of them are coming back not happy about what they're seeing over there. They talk to me, some of the things, of the drug trade, seeing barrels, listen to this, crates of, <laughs> crates of American money just being flown in and handed out to other government, uh, of, of people in other co- countries. No accountability for it. I've had officers tell me that. And the drug stuff, uh, uh, the opium trade and all that over in those countries. Basically, uh, Americans guarding opium fields. I had an Air Force officer who said it, it so disillusioned him. He could not believe he, he got out of the service. He quit. Uh, they come back disillusioned because there's a lot of corruption going on, and uh, the government doesn't like anybody, number one, thinking like and number two, knowing how to use a gun. And how to fight back. That's why they watch them so darn closely. Operation Vigil Eagle, I've written on it. You can, and I, it's in my book, of Governor Wolves, but it's also on our website at rutherford.org. Yeah, I was going to ask you next about on your book, A Government of uh, Wolves, what are some of the things that you're suggesting to people in the book? I mean, don't give away the whole candy story, but you kind of get what I mean. I mean, what should they do? Yeah. Well, we talked about that. I think that uh, there have been some people who have made amazing changes. One was Martin Luther King. I talked a bit about him. He was very planned, um, you know, and I, I think it eventually got him killed. <laughs> yeah. He, uh, before he, uh, right before he got assassinated, 
he wrote an article that came out at, right after he got assassinated, where he was planning to shut Washington down. He had uh, he had already trained what he called his peace marshals. Uh, they were going to build a shanty town. Uh, they were going to uh, go up on the type of steps of the Capitol and lock government down. He said the government no longer listens to us. And it wasn't just for black people. He was arguing for everybody. He said they don't listen to the average American anymore. Uh, so he had a detailed plan. And I think before you do that, I think uh, in my book I go through some of that. Uh, on our website I've written about that. You just need to educate yourself. I don't think anybody can tell you go how to do this. First, you've got to have motiv- motivation. The motivation is what? Your kids, freedom. Do you really believe uh, what America stands for? Uh, two, you have to do a little bit of studying. That means turn the TV off for a while. The Gum of the Wolves is a good book to read. There are other books out there. Go to our website, Rutherford.org. Go to our Freedom Watch page. You will see all the things we detail that's going on in the country, and that should scare them the holy poop out of you. Um, and an average citizen can do it. I really believe that. I mean, if it happened in 1776. Uh, King did a lot of good things. There are other activists out there. We just can't give up. Perseverance is the key. Perseverance is the key to the future. If you don't persevere, then uh, what we're seeing, uh, and it's come very rapidly, by the way, since 9-11. It's only going to get worse. Remember, drones start flying over America starting in what, a month? Yeah. You know, I was just thinking about that. 9-11 was roughly, what, 13, 14 years ago. Yes. And the biggest part of the changes that we're looking at now seems like they it was just a fast barrage of the domino effect from 9-1-1 up to today. Yeah. Yeah, the Patriot Act was passed a, about a month after the 9-11 and the terrorist acts, it was 400 pages. And, I mean, Ron Paul, a number of politicians have come out and said it, it was written before. It was already there. But it it gave the government full power to go through all your records, to do sneak and peek searches, to come in your home while you're not there, download stuff off the computer and leave. Now, let's go back again. <laughs> the Fourth Amendment says you're not supposed to be doing that stuff. But the Patriot Act says you can do it. Um, so, yeah, it's... There, there are people in government who want power. They live in control, but most, mostly I think it's money and greed and power. Well, you know, I was thinking about that. There have been people that have uh, said online that 911 was a uh, false flag movement. The whole idea was they needed to pass some laws, so they needed a terrorist attack to show a need for these laws to be passed, like the uh, Patriot Act. So I begin to wonder if there wasn't something to that theory. Yeah, I think that, um, well, there's a good line in a movie once where a guy was accused of being paranoid. And he said, paranoid? And the guy said, yeah, you know what that means. And he looked back and said, that means I'm very perceptive. Um, (laughs) A little paranoia today can go a long way into maybe opening your mind. I think that I'm suspicious of government. Um, Well, give me, the guy who wrote our Bill of Rights, James Madison, said, we ought to mistrust all those in power. Now, he sounds a bit paranoid, but he was a wise man. So we ought, when, when uh, politicians' lips move, I've always, people think I'm joking, but really I'm not. When, when, I, I don't want a politician's lie when his lips move. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't trust anything they say. Give me the evidence. Let me see it. Now, if, if, if the average American would work off that premise, we would live in a much better country. Now, you don't trust anything that either side says. doesn't matter no. if it's Democrat or Republican. It's government. It, the lips are moving. It's lying. <laughs> I've been doing this for 40 years. I've sued so many. I mean, fighting politicians more right wing and left. No. If they're in the hip pocket of some large lobbyist, no. Most of them are. There are a few who aren't, by the way, and they're good men. But uh, I would say most that I run into are greatly influenced by the golfing trips, the trips abroad, the airplane trips. The money, the bottle for the of water, the, the free flowers on their desk. The, by the way, most people don't know this, and, and veterans are outraged by this. The good veterans I work with, the Walter Reed Hospital, a veteran has to go in if he's got a, a sickness or a complaint and sit in the lobby. The congressmen, most of them who have never served in the armed forces, go up on a gold plated elevator and get immediate service. Now, what does that say to you? Special treatment. You got it. Which I, there is a lot of special treatment that does go on. But, well, you know, but in all Nancy, remember Nancy Pelosi was getting uh, 
what, $5,000 a month, bottle of water and flowers on her desk every day. Yeah, but not, I don't know many Americans that American. can afford bottled water and flowers every day on their desk. And we pay for that, the taxpayer. Yeah, the, they don't want the taxpayer paying for food stamps, but they do let them pay for bottled water. <laughs> I'd like to take the bottled water and pour it over her head. So. Yeah, but, you know, in, in all honesty, though, isn't it all the governments around the world are going sort toward the same trend? Oh, yes. We're moving into a global police state. There's no doubt about that. And one, one tip off of that, if you watch the Chinese protests here lately, the police there look so similar to our police. Same kind of dress, same kind of weapons. Uh, the police in London, Britain, Australia all look the same now. And they coordinate and work together when they need to. Again, follow the wisdom of James Madison, the author of our Bill of Rights. We ought to mistrust all those in power. But there's been plenty of warnings, I think, down through the ages about uh, keeping a watch on the watchman because when people start trusting government too much, uh, if they don't trust them, people want to say they're paranoid. If they do trust them, they become fools and they fall for, for not having a watchman on the government. The government, with nobody to watch them, has a free reign to do what they want to do. Yes. Eternal vigilant. It's uh, Thomas, quoting Thomas Jefferson. Let me hear no moral confidence in men. Bind them down with the chains of the Constitution. And how do you bind them down with the chains of the Constitution? A, number one, know it. Uh, and number two, exercise your rights. And they get the point. They don't want you to be out there getting active. That's why they want you sitting in front of a TV set with a... Uh, TV dinner, whatever you're doing, while they spout their so-called wisdom. Also, I think it's a lot easier to control if you're spouting off on the internet than if you're spouting off in downtown Houston or New York in front of a whole crowd of people. Yep. But here's the point. Um, again, it's uh, it's late in the day, and I know the program's getting near the end here. It's late in the day. I, I would say, um, you know, again, I go back and quote one of the founding fathers, take alarm at the first experiment with liberties. Well, that first, that's James Madison again. The first experiment was a long time ago. Take, take alarm at the first experiment with liberties. Because government has always abused itself. I'm afraid, as I've said, we're starting to copy regimes of the past. And it's right. not going to be pretty. Uh, there's all this talk about so-called FEMA camps around the country. That may be true. If that's true, and Halliburton was given a lot of money, it's a big corporation that Dick Cheney worked with under Bush to build what they call emergency, like their FEMA detention camps, or uh, that's also known as a concentration camp. We actually did a project where I had lawyers and students call Halliburton, the big corporation, supposed to build these concentration camps back during the Bush administration. They referred us to the Department of Homeland Security. <laughs> the Department of Homeland Security referred us to another corporation. It went around the circle for two days. No one would answer the question whether or not they exist. And to this day, they still haven't. Um, I, don't, I think Albert spent the money, yeah. So, so they built the camps. Yeah. What I want to ask you real quick, like though, because you're right, we're about to run out of time. Is there anything you want to throw out there that we, uh, you haven't had a chance to say yet? No, I think I've said basically what I think is important. I think... Um, I'll say this, education precedes action. And what I mean by that is you've got to get active. You've got to uh, learn your Bill of Rights. You can go to our website. I have, we have a Constitution section on there. Learn what's in the Fourth Amendment especially, the Third Amendment. Learn what's in the First Amendment, your right to assemble and get out there and get active. Uh, teach your children in the home the Bill of Rights. Uh, again, you can take them to our website. And just sit there and say, here, you got to learn, you have a right to free speech. You shouldn't sit mute when you see someone getting beat up or hurt. Uh, if, some, if, if, a, if a government official of any kind grabs you by the shoulder and pushes you around or something, report that to me because they're violating your Constitution. So you can teach your kids their rights, and they do listen, by the way, but especially to their parents if their parents are concerned. So it has to start today. I don't think you can wait till tomorrow. I think they might have already waited too late, but I hope not. <laughs> I think there's still a chance uh, if people get active. I think I've seen some uprisings here lately. They're good. There's a good sign that Americans actually will get out and do something. Um, but it's going to take more than uh, a handful of people, and you're absolutely correct about that. Oh, yeah. I, I will have to admit, in all honesty, if you read Facebook, 
you see uh, notices on there about people been fighting for uh, higher minimum wages for people. And that's actually had an effect because the same people that was fighting for it are uh, is now posting, uh, you know, images that are saying they're congratulating the places that have actually ra- um, raised the uh, wage, in other words. Well, it's a, and again, I've been involved in this for 40 years. What the politician, right wing, left wing, Republican, Democrat, whoever they are, fear the most is citizen activity. Uh, as I've always said, one guy at a city council meeting with a sign, a protest sign, is considered a weirdo. Two people or three people with the same sign is considered a movement, and they start listening because they want to get elected again and get all those perks that they get. Um, so you can have an impact. I'm just telling people you can do it, but you have to do it. And that's that's the key. You can't, you can't, can't talk expect, about it. No one else is going to do it, no. And if you love your children, your grandchildren, the kids down the street, you'll get up and do something. Okie doke. Well, that's the music that's telling us that this uh, section of the show is over. I want to thank you for joining us today, and uh, I'd love to have you back anytime in the future. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You have a good one.